up there. <laughs> guys are lucky to get the attention. I know guys, I'm telling you, you're lucky to get the attention, gentlemen. Amen. I do enjoy uh, some of the traditions. I haven't been to Orthodox shuls yet, really, to speak of, just very little. I would like to do a little bit more of that, but the did. ladies are there and the men are there. Oh, you can be seated, by the way. And all you have to do is ask, well, why is this so? You got your wives. Why, why are they over there? Why are you over here? And it's just because any of them will look at you and say, a woman is a beautiful thing. That's right. And that's the time to look upon the Lord without competition. Hallelujah. Saul of Tarsus, better known as Paul, also went to the synagogue. And when he, he always went to the synagogue first. If he went to another city, wherever it was, the first place he went to was the synagogue. And you can see examples of that if you're taking notes. Acts 13, 14, Acts 14, 1, Acts 17, 1 through 3. He would go to the synagogue and share the good news. And what was he sharing? Well, he was following the scripture, Romans 1. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. I stopped. Why did I stop? Because unfortunately, most churches today, they stop right there. They don't continue. For it says to the Jew first and also to the Greek or the non-Jew. They forgot a very important scripture, didn't they? If we're not sharing with Jewish people as a church, we've lost the power already. We're not following what God wants. We're not following the scriptures. So you can see we can learn from Paul's example. He always went to the local synagogue and shared the good news first, and then he went to the Gentiles afterwards. If we go to the next slide, we can see that the early church has, begins to start having problems. Messianic Jews under attack. So as the congregation, the body of believers starts to grow, um, Gentiles start to get saved. And what happens, it becomes more Greek or Gentile in orientation, both in worship, theology, and church practices, and starts to drift away from Israel, drifting away from the Jewish roots. 
and m most probably not spending enough time in the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures, right? So we begin to see that. And then we see right below that, there's the uh, Bar Kokhba revolt in the year 132, 135. The temple had already been destroyed, but there were still Jewish people uh, in the area, in Jerusalem. And Rabbi Akiva declared Bar Kokhba to, the be, to be the Messiah. Now at that time, the, the Messianic Jews were fighting with the other Jewish people uh, to try to get the Romans out of Israel. But as soon as he de Rabbi Akiva declared uh, Bar Kokhba to be the Messiah, uh, the Messianic Jews stopped fighting the Romans and deserted the city um, because uh, they realized what Yeshua warned us in the scriptures and what he warned them by word, that when you see these things happening, you know, flee the city. Uh, that happened in year 70 as well. So what happened was the rebellion was crushed and uh, the Jewish believers were branded as traitors by fellow Jews and they were uh, then considered outcasts. Before that, the Messianic movement, which was called the Way, was another part of Judaism. They were considered Jews. They were part of the community, but then they were kicked out. And so um, that was the beginning of their downfall. And then, of course, like I say, uh, what the uh, other Christians that were Gentiles were starting to do. Now, if we go to the next slide, here we go. Anti-Semitism in the early church. So I'm gonna give examples. Uh, and we can see there's three councils that met um, during this time frame. So over the next 200 years, the church becomes more Gentile in membership in nature, right? More and more people getting saved. Obviously, if there's more Gentiles than there are Jews, then they begin to uh, influence the body of believers. So the, some of the things began to change. And so um, as early as the second century, Ignatius of Antioch began teaching that Christians should not partake in Passover meals. I have a problem with that, wow. I mean, doesn't Passover demonstrate the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah? If you share anybody with, at your home, Jew or non-Jew, they're gonna see that, and that's a good evangelism opportunity, yet Ignatius is saying, don't do Passover. And also, Justin Martyr, around the same time, was claiming that the church had replaced Israel. Okay, so you get the beginnings of replacement theology, which means that the church replaces Israel, all the blessings that go to Israel, being part of Israel, are replaced, and they get all the blessings, and Israel is pretty much cut off and cursed. So they don't want any of the curses, they just want all the blessings, right? So then we also see um, in the third century, Tortillan uh, and other church far fathers like Origen uh, were calling Jews Christ killers. Wow, what Bible were they reading? So you could see what was happening. So there's increasing hostility against Jewish believers. Uh, we have the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, um, which was pres presided over by Emperor Constantine, who, s who supposedly became a believer, changed the date of the celebration of the resurrection so that it would no longer be identified with the Jewish feast of Passover. And the council also justified its action by stating it's unbecoming beyond measure that the holiest of festivals, in quotes, Easter, we should follow the customs of the Jews. Therefore, henceforth, let us have nothing in common with this odious people. So what they did is they took the, uh, the Jewish calendar, which uh, this morning we learned about the lunar cycles, right? Was replaced by the, the, uh, the solar calendar, the sun calendar, which is the Roman calendar. So therefore, not, not following that calendar any longer, uh, Easter drifted, or Resurrection Day drifted away to another calendar, and except for occasionally, was no longer the same date. So let's, so uh, basically they want to cut Israel off. Finally, the council, of, well, two more councils. Uh, the Council of Antioch in 341 prohibited Christians from celebrating Passover with Jewish people, and the Council of Laodicea in the year 364 uh, stopped Christians from observing the Jewish Sabbath. So basically what that's saying is uh, Christians must not Judaize uh, by resting on the Shabbat, the Sabbath, but must work on that day. And then they commanded all Christians to make sure that the Lord's Day would be their day of rest, meaning the Sunday. And they pronounced it an anthema upon any Christian who observed the Sabbath. So they really 
made a total separation between the, Jew, the Jewish people and the non-Jew. And this went on for 1,600 years. So back during that time, if a Jewish person uh, did come to faith, however they came to faith, some were forced conversions, you had to basically stop your Jewish faith and become a Christian, renounce what you are as a Jew, no more bar bar that's free of your children, no more Jewish cultural or practices. Um, basically, they had to become part of the church. And so um, it started with the church. The, de the Satan did a good job of invading the church and influencing uh, the Gentile portion to go against the Jewish people. And uh, so there was a separation for a very long time. And we'll see now how it affected Jewish people in their faith. If they can't practice their faith, then in effect they've given up who they are. Not just nationality, racially, but also culturally. So if we go to the next slide, and I'm, because of, of time here, I can't cover everything, but I'm gonna talk mostly uh, in this section when it comes to American missions. Now I'm jumping about 16, 1700 years in the future. There was a rabbi named Leopold Cohen who um, read the New, New Testament. I'm sure I've shared about him in the past. Um, he, someone gave him a New Testament uh, in New York City where he had moved to, and he realized Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah of Israel and promptly started uh, a fellowship in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, and it was called uh, another, thing, another name by uh, later on. It was changed but uh, became the ABMJ, American Board Missions to the Jews, which in 1980s was changed to Chosen People Ministries, and we'll talk about that later. So uh, if you look at page 33 of his book, To an Ancient People, uh, by faith he had almost no money. Uh, he rented a storefront um, from a fellow Jewish person, and uh, he had his first meeting on a Saturday morning. Seven Jewish people showed up to give him a hard time about Jesus, but they actually sat down and listened to him and actually were interested in what he had to say once he started speaking. The next week, 16 people showed up. Eventually, the room was filled up. So even though this wasn't the beginning of a messianic movement, he was teaching in Yiddish uh, the New Testament to fellow Jewish people in New York City. And during his lifetime, Rabbi Cohen led over 1,000 people to the Lord. So God really used him in a mighty way. I find it more than a coincidence, because there's no coincidences with God, that this is around the time of the first Zionist conference in London that Rabbi Cohen gets saved and starts the uh, American board. So now moving a little bit further into the future, if we go to the next slide, in the early 20th century, more Jewish people were felt impressed that there should be some kind of fellowship that fellow Jewish believers can have, even though they were almost probably going to separate churches, unless they were going to some of these Bible studies that Rabbi Cohen was doing. So what happened was, uh, in 1915, was the very first conference. It was on April 6th through the 9th in New York City. They met. And I'm gonna read a section of the preamble Number one, to unite Jewish believers into a corporate testimony and to urge them, in the name of the Lord Yeshua, to give up their differences. Next slide, please. To multiply, uplift each other, and to raise the spiritual standard of the Jewish believers that they might be worthy representatives of the Lord Yeshua to the Jew and the Gentile alike. And number three, to encourage Jewish believers to, to come out openly and um, boldly in the confession of Messiah. It means you don't have to just hide inside the church. You can say, hey, I'm a Jew and I believe in Yeshua. And so that, that may not seem much to us today, but that was pre pretty dramatic, that, uh, that preamble. And it was approved at the first conference. If we go to the next slide, in the conference in 1917, Mark Levy, a Jewish believer, delivered a paper at the conference that Jewish people and their families can practice various Jewish practices that are God-given rights, and talked about that we should practice the holidays. How come we don't practice the holidays anymore? And he showed in Leviticus 23, nowhere did it say that Jewish people should stop practicing holidays. But God, God says we should practice them forever. That means millennial kingdom, for sure, right? 
So if we're supposed to do it then, how come we're not doing it now? So um, they voted on it. Mark Levy and one other lady voted for it. The rest of the group that met voted it down. We weren't ready for it yet. That shows you what was going on in 1917. So right below that, you can see Messianic congregations were dormant from 1920s to 1960s. Most Jewish people, however they came to faith, joined the, uh, some kind of church, some kind of denomination, Presbyterian, Baptist, whatever you want to call it, joined the church, and usually within one generation, they were wiped out because most probably their kids married a non-Jewish person, didn't understand about Jewish identity, and it just faded away. So if we go to the next slide, we talk about the rebirth of Messianic Judaism. So we have a gentleman named Martin Chernoff. Martin Chernoff is a Jewish man, and in 1941, after reading some periodicals, he came to faith in Messiah. Martin was very interested right away in Jewish evangelism, but he was kind of ahead of his time. Remember, it was 1941. And he was working for some evangelistic organizations and being a pastor of a church. And so in 1948, he has the first of three visions. This man is really the father of modern Messianic Judaism, and we should give him his due. We should not ignore him without Martin Chernoff. I know God could have raised someone else, but he was the man. So anyway, 1948, the same year that Israel became a nation again, Martin has a vision. The vision was of a vast and endless orchard spread out across the land. The trees were loaded with fruit. The finger of God was stirring the leaves of the trees, and the branches were shaking. Marty interpreted this vision to mean that a great group, multitude of Jewish people were ready to be saved, and he was to pray for revival. So that's what he and his wife, Johanna, started to do. Pray for revival. Pray for revival. In 1963, he had the second vision. This time, he saw multitudes of Jewish people singing and laughing and streaming into God's kingdom from every direction. To Marty's amazement, they were all young and shabby, unkempt, and dressed in rags. I'm almost laughing. <laughs> As he puzzled, puzzled over his dramatic vision, Marty heard the Lord say, these are my ragged and righteous remnant. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Finally, in in 1970, he has the third vision. He was looking up in the sky, and he saw a banner emblazed on the sky, and in big letters it said, Messianic Judaism. He knew time was right. He resigned from his position where he was uh, ministering and started a congregation. Now, right before that, we go to the next slide. Oh, oh no, you're on the right slide, sorry. Um, this, we had the Six-Day War. Six-Day War is a very, very important war for Israel because we wake up from the dead. Okay, we physically have the land back, right, for 19 years, but we can't go to the rest of Jerusalem. We can't go to the wall and pray. We're forbidden to do that. And so they win the war, and they get the rest of Jerusalem back. So for the first time since the year 70, the Jewish people control Jerusalem, the whole city, again. 